Hello friends, I'm Abby from Abby's Bookish Life and today I am going to be talking about my next Young Adult Rereads vlog and what my plans are for that. So I'm actually recording this after I finish the vlog. I have finished reading all three of the books that I'm about to tell you about and overall I really enjoyed it and I'm excited for you to hear my thoughts. So let's get right on into it. My plan for the month of July was to reread these three young adult novels, and that was Uglies by Scott Westerfeld, Pendragon the Merchant of Death by DJ McHale, and The Giver by Lois Lowry. Uglies is a pretty popular young adult dystopia novel that is set in a time kind of post-apocalyptic to our time now when everybody when they turn 16 is turned into a pretty and before that you remain an ugly so becoming a pretty means basically getting a surgery that makes you look exactly like everyone else they don't look exactly the same but essentially the point is to make it so that everybody is attractive and has the exact same skin color and features and all of that so that there is no hate or discrimination now of course it's not a utopia like they try to make it seem in the book so it is very interesting and takes a lot of twists and turns when i was in middle school i remember absolutely loving this book and of course it has a main character that is a feisty girl who is kind of fighting against what is expected of her and so middle school me was obsessed and absolutely loved that overall this story is about tally who is about to turn 16 and become a pretty and she meets a friend named shay who convinces her that maybe turning pretty isn't the best thing in the world and tries to convince tally to run away with her and when Shay runs away, it creates a whole world of problems for Tally, and it takes a lot of twists and turns from there. Next is Pendragon, the Merchant of Death. This is Brent's favorite series from when he was a young adult, and, and I actually read this in high school after he and I met. So the entire series is a fascinating one for me and is one of my favorite young adult series of all time just because it takes place on so many different worlds and different areas so it adds kind of a funky like fantastical element to each book you never know what you're gonna get going into it now the first book the merchant of death takes place on the territory of Dendron, and the book spends much of the time kind of discussing how the world works where why they're doing what they're doing, why Bobby was chosen to be the traveler between Second Earth and Dendron, and kind of setting you up for the entire series. And this book is set up a little differently as well because it is essentially being told in the form of letters coming from Bobby to his friends Mark and Courtney on Second Earth, and then it goes back and forth between the letters and Mark and Courtney's reaction to the letters and living real time on Second Earth. And last but not least, The Giver by Lois Lowry. This I consider to be one of my all-time favorite books, probably in my top 10. It was such a foundational book for me growing up and I've read it multiple times throughout the years. And so this time I decided to give the audiobook a try and read that and see how I felt and if that affected the way I read the story. Now, with this being one of my favorite books of all time, I didn't realize it was a quartet. I didn't realize there were more than one book and I've talked about that before. So I was very excited to get into reading this because I want to keep reading the sequels, which I haven't been doing for the other books that I've been rereading, but this one I plan to continue after I read The Giver. If you're unfamiliar with the story of The Giver, it is a dystopian world where everything is focused on the idea of sameness and people don't see color, they don't have a lot of choices, and everything is very systematic every year you kind of like get something else until you turn 12 and you are given a career and it focuses on the main character Jonas as he's approaching the ceremony where he'll find out what his career what his job will be in the community and kind of how he processes that and how he feels about it this is a very short book it's only 165 pages so relatively short probably closer to like a novella but it feels like a full story. I set out very excited for the month and I'm going to let you get right on into how I felt as I was reading the books. In case you missed my last video, this video will have some spoilers for these books. If you don't want to see the spoilers, 
maybe read the books first and come back. For the most part, I well, I'm going to be talking about the books freely. So come back maybe after you've read the books or if you don't mind being spoiled, stick around, see how I feel, see my reactions. I don't know. It's a free world. Do what you want. Okay, let's get right into the video. Good morning. This is going to be the start of day one of this reading vlog where I reread some YA favorites. And I decided to start with Uglies by Scott Westerfeld. I remember loving this when it came out when I was in middle school. I read the entire series. I maybe missed the last one, but I don't remember anything about this series. And I am so excited to get back into it because it is one of my favorites from when I was a young adult and I just don't remember anything. So today I have kind of a busy day. So in case you didn't know, Brent and I are in a two person musical called The Last Five Years. The show opens tomorrow. So today's our final dress rehearsal. And that means that in the afternoon sometime I have to curl my hair. I need to get my makeup on. Um, I have a couple things I have to gather and I like to treat myself during tech week by making a coffee or going and getting a latte or something just to give me that extra boost of energy since rehearsals do last longer on tech week days. The company that I'm doing it through is called Dare to Defy and they're being very safe. They're staying very informed about how to best protect us as actors, as well as the audience members and the band. So I definitely feel like it's very safe. Everything's being sanitized. And I'm just really excited to be back into theater. However, it does mean that this week especially is a little bit crazy. So today I'm gonna take you guys along. I am gonna relax at the pool today. I haven't been there in so long. And it's gonna be like 90 degrees and sunny. So I have pool chairs that my mom got for us for an anniversary present. So I'm gonna take a pool chair down and probably read a little bit of uglies and get into it because I'm ready to start this reading vlog. And I'll take you along as I make dinner. So I'll see you guys soon. I am back. I had a wonderful afternoon at the pool and now it's starting to look like it's going to rain. So it looks like I timed my pool trip perfectly. As you can tell, I got ready for the show. It's about 4.30 right now. And so I'm about to start cooking dinner so that it can be ready at 5.30 when Brent gets home. But I'm updating you to say that I read the first 100 pages of Uglies and I'm loving it. I'm hooked. I didn't remember anything about this book other than the basic premise of there being a place for people who turned a certain age and then you get transformed into a pretty. But I'm at the point now where Pally, the main character, is going in for her surgery to become a pretty. And they came and pulled her aside and said, there's something wrong with your surgery and they took her away. So now things aren't going according to plan and I'm so excited to see what happens next. This book has really short chapters, which I love. Um, it helps me fly through it. It helps me get really invested and really hooked and I'm just really enjoying it so far. So I will take you guys along as I cook my dinner, but I just wanted to give you an update and say that I love the writing. I'm loving the characters. It reads very 16 year old to me and I don't mind that because when I read this in middle school it felt so much more connected to who I was. Reading it as an adult I am a little bit like okay stop but I do really enjoy it and I think the writing is great and it sounds like a very true 16 year old so I'm loving it so far I can't wait to keep reading. Now let's go make some dinner. Hello, we are back at it. Good morning. I had to do some work today, so I got up and have been doing some 
I mean, it's not really work. I have to organize some Google Drive stuff for like resources that I've been gathering for online counseling, for some like e-resources for kids, and I need to, <laughs> can you hear that water running? <laughs> but I had to, I have to collect all of those and like put them in their perspective Google Drive folders and make sure I'm all organized because I have less than a month before school starts and I'm freaking out a little bit. But anyway, I did that and I, um, had to fill out some forms for my contract. And otherwise, I've just been I'm watching Lexi on booktube and Olivia Reads a Latte posted a video today. So I've been watching that and I finished another book. So I've been having kind of a busy morning and I'm about to get into Uglies again. We're back reading it and I will update you guys when I finish another 100 pages, it only took me about an hour to read 100 pages yesterday. So I'm going to power through, see if I can get to 200 pages by the time I eat lunch, because it's about 11 a.m. So we will see what happens. Okay, my update for what I've read so far in The Uglies. I am at page 203, so I finished another 100 pages. I just ate lunch. I did finish my 100 pages before lunch, which was my goal, so I feel good about that. Um, so what I'm loving about this book, it is very much like a typical young adult novel where the, you get bits and pieces of the world as you go. It's not like an info dump all at the beginning. It is very like I'm discovering new things all the time. Like for example, Tally doesn't know what a roller coaster is and that's just kind of like an interesting tidbit of information you get as you're reading and then it obviously comes back into play later. In the last 100 pages that I read, it was basically her journey. So the first 100 pages were kind of her meeting Shay, who is a good friend she meets after her only friend, really, Paris, goes and becomes a pretty. And so Tally and Shay are becoming good friends. Shay decides to leave and not become a pretty at all. And Tally decides to stay. And then the special circumstance unit finds Tally and on the day of her surgery where she's supposed to become a pretty, it pulls her aside, says this isn't gonna work. And basically it's like, you have to go find Shay. And once you find her, set off this little alarm, we'll come get everybody and like take down their like runaway situation, whatever. And then you can become a pretty. But until then you're gonna be ugly forever. So Tally in her mind is like, don't really got a choice. I have to do this. So. That was the first 100 pages, very like action packed. And then the second 100 pages, the most recent 100 pages I read, it is very much her adventure, trying to follow the directions that Shay gave her, which are in code. So it's kind of like a riddle and she's basically figuring out what the riddle means and trying to find this place called the Smokes, which is where um, the runaways who don't become pretty end up and Shay went there to meet a man named David who Tally didn't really believe existed but now we find out did exist and so the past 100 pages she's just been like following the riddle figuring out what the riddle means figuring out how to get there and something that I love about this that I didn't basically I didn't remember anything about it I don't know what happened I forgot everything um but what I love about this is that there's some symbolism coming through that I definitely would not have picked up on when I read it as a middle schooler. The symbolism involves these flowers that are part of Tally's riddle that she's trying to solve to get to the smokes. And the flowers are taking over this huge field, basically taking over everything. And there are pretties who are responsible for setting fire to the fields of flowers and burning them down. And Tally comes in contact with these people and is like, what are you doing? They're the ones who help her get there, get to the smokes. And she basically says, what are you doing? And the fire starters say, well, these flowers have become a monoculture. And a monoculture is where one flower takes over everything and makes it so that no other flowers and no other organisms can exist. It's just that one beautiful thing. And it is beautiful. They're beautiful flowers, but it's just that flower always everywhere. And they basically imply that because that beautiful flower is everywhere, but it doesn't serve a purpose that 
it's a problem and that they have to burn it out so that other organisms, different flowers can live. And the symbolism of that is beautiful. The idea that Scott Westerfeld created this society that is a monoculture of beautiful things that don't allow any other organisms or types of flowers or types of people to exist and then tying in that symbolism with the flowers i definitely missed that as a young adult and it was just a beautiful touch of symbolism that i didn't get when i read it the first time so i am going to get back into reading this now that i finished lunch i watched an episode of the handmaid's tale it's starting to storm outside i can hear the thunder rumbling in the distance and I'm ready to get back into reading this. I'll maybe read another 100 pages today. We'll see. All right, quick update. First of all, it's absolutely pouring outside, so I was right that it was going to storm, and it's a perfect day for reading. I think I might go get a coffee from a little coffee shop in my neighborhood because I'm really feeling like I want a latte, and I ran out of coffee creamer today, so if I want a latte, I have to go buy it. So I think I'm gonna go get one of those this afternoon since it's nice and cozy and rainy. I have to edit a video, um, but I just wanted to give a little update because something that just happened is something I really love in the book. And Tally gets gloves from David. He gives her a pair of gloves and she is like really moved by the gift and he's like, calm down, it's not that big of a deal. And she says, it is a big deal. They've got something. And she realizes that the something they have is history. And it just was really inspiring to read about a character who wants to be surrounded by things that have a good history or have a history to them. Because I recently have been experiencing this where I feel like I want to buy pieces of furniture. I want to buy things from used places so that I can have things in my life that have a history to them and that mean something to me and meant something to people before me. So it just felt really special and I just wanted to talk about it. That's all. Okay, this will likely be my last update for the day because it is opening night of the show, so I will be busy. <laughs> Basically for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be frantically getting my stuff together and getting dinner ready so that as soon as Brent gets home, we can run out the door and go to our show because our call is a little bit earlier than it normally is. So I read 100 more pages of Uglies and it got intense, it got real. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, Tally's whole mission going into the book was she had to find Shay and the smoke and all of the people living in this runaway society in order to be turned pretty. While she's there during this last 100 pages, she decides that she doesn't want to go back and be turned pretty. She wants to stay here. She has found her best friend Shay. She meets this guy David and she's like falling in love with him basically. And so she doesn't want to betray them. So she takes her pendant off that has a tracker in it. And instead of scanning it and telling the special circumstances where she is, she throws it in the fire. It explodes, she thinks it's over, but the specials just showed up. They are here and they are not playing. So I only have about a hundred pages left and I probably won't read any more today, but I will definitely be finishing it tomorrow. So this will likely be it for today, and I will see you guys tomorrow morning after opening night has ended. Good morning. Today is going to be a fun day. I'm going to get brunch with my friend Caitlin at a little cafe nearby, so I'm very excited for that. Um, it's about 8 a.m. right now, so before I do that, I'm going to try to read a little bit of Uglies and see how far I can get before I have brunch. I'm about 100 pages away from the end and things are getting intense, so I'm excited to get into it.
I'm back from brunch and the area where we got some brunch is called Yellow Springs and they have a couple used and indie bookshops there. And so I did end up picking up Miracle Creek, which is actually a book of the month edition of Miracle Creek by Angie Kim. So I'm very excited that I got it. And they gave us this little bookmark that says a world of books for young and old and Dark Star Books was the name of the bookshop that I went and got this book at. So I'm very excited and I just wanted to share with you my little book haul for the day because I love shopping and walking around the shops in Yellow Springs and I'm happy that I got to support an indie bookshop in a town near me. So when I got home from brunch, I finished Uglies and oh boy. So this book is intense. The last 100 pages were um, filled with escapes daring uh, deeds, cool technology, interesting like new ideas for different technological things and different ways that they used old technology from like the Rusty's age, which is what they called basically what we're living in right now. And it was just really cool and fascinating and very fast paced. And I really, really enjoyed it. I think that I originally gave it four stars. I think I'd probably stick with that. What I do wish, which I know that the point of this is not to be a romance, but I do wish it had a little bit more because you do get the really sweet Tally and David connection, but then at the end she's like, I know that David will be the one to save me and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just kind of like, how do you know that though? Because y'all only kissed twice. Now, what I do like about this book and what I appreciate about it is that Tally is not a perfect protagonist. She is holding a secret basically until the last 15 pages. I like that the author shows us that she can make good decisions and try to make up for her mistake, but that she does have to be honest at some point. She can't go on making up lies and like coming up with excuses forever. So she finally takes responsibility for her decisions and her actions and she decides to try to correct her mistakes and I really respect that and I really like that in this character and the ending had me a little bit shook and I kind of want to keep reading because if you watched my last rereading YA favorites I said about the end of The Hunger Games that it ended without really resolving any of the issues and it kind of made it more important that you go immediately and read the next book. It was like a serious cliffhanger where nothing was resolved. That's basically how this one ends. It ends with you being like, but wait, what happens? Like a character runs off and like doesn't come back. There's no reunion. So I'm like, what? Where did they go? Why do we not get to see them make up? Why do we now have to like go to the next book just to find out what happened? That's just me wanting to the conflict to end and things to wrap up nice and beautifully. But overall, four stars, great book. It was foundational to my young adult years and I can definitely see why I stick by my choice of making this one of my favorite young adult books. It really changed my life when I was in middle school and I stand by that. So. Overall, I liked it a lot and I'm ready to get moving on to the next book. Next, I'll be reading The Giver by Lois Lowry and I'm so excited to get into reading this because I want to read the sequels, which I've never read. So I'm going to be reading this over the next day or so and I'm excited to get into it. We'll see if it holds up. Okay, I am back with an update. So I am trying to read both of the young adult books that I have left, so The Giver, which I had already started in my last update, and Pendragon, The Merchant of Death. I am listening to The Giver on audiobook as well as reading it physically, so I decided to add Pendragon in as well because I felt like I was going really quickly through The Giver and I wanted to stretch it out a little bit longer. So I am currently 100 pages exactly for The Giver, and I love this book. I'm so obsessed with it. I think that it is just such a beautiful concept. It is interesting. It is impactful. And I just got to the point where the giver is giving Jonas memories of pain. And it's just so beautiful to listen to. And the world building, the idea of the world, the idea that everything is the way it is because 
it protects human beings to not be able to make choices, to have everything be the same. It's just very reminiscent actually of uglies. So I'm very happy that I'm reading these at the same time because I love that that idea is kind of the common thread through both of them. So I'm loving The Giver so far. I cannot wait to keep reading it. And the audiobook is pretty good. It has a score underneath it for a lot of the story. So it's really cool to have some music in there as well. I also just finished the first 100 pages of Pendragon, The Merchant of Death, which is the first book in the Pendragon series. And this book moved slower than I expected it to, but it's different from the other young adult fantasy books that I've been reading, so I'm really enjoying it. And it holds a special place in my heart, like I remember it fondly, and so I'm really excited to read it. What's interesting and different about this book is that it's told in two different perspectives one that is in first person from Bobby's perspective, and then the second one is from his friends Mark and Courtney, and it's kind of a third person perspective for them. And it goes back and forth between Dendron, which is the, the world that Bobby is in, and Second Earth, which is the world that Mark and Courtney are in, and that Bobby came from. And it's not very clearly explained yet what the two different worlds mean and whether it's different dimensions, whether it's just two different planets. They actually discuss in here, because Bobby says a different planet, and Uncle Press, who is Bobby's uncle, says not planets, territories. It's very, very interesting. While all of this is going on, so Bobby is on Dendron trying to save this, like, <laughs> group of people. Mark and Courtney are not understanding anything. They're getting these letters through this ring that you can see on the cover that Bobby sent to Mark. They're getting these letters from Bobby that explain all this crazy stuff that is happening to Bobby and in Bobby's world on Dendron and to Uncle Press who took Bobby there. While all that's happening, Bobby's house, his parents, his pets, his sister, they've all disappeared. It's almost like his house, his family, Bobby himself never existed at all. And Mark and Courtney clearly remember Bobby, and so do the people in the community, which I think is very interesting. Because not often do you have a disappearance story where, or a fantasy story where an entire family disappears and everybody in the town still remembers them. It's usually told from the idea of one person remembers them and everybody else has no idea what they're talking about. So I do love that right towards the end of these 100 pages, Mark and Courtney go to the police chief, and the police chief is like, yeah, I'm really good friends with Bobby's family. I remember them, and it doesn't make any sense that they're not here. And of course, they're investigating it as if it's a human reason that they have disappeared, whereas it seems in the book to be a fantastical reason. So I'm very excited to see where it takes me because I don't remember a whole lot of the story and what happens. In terms of what's happening on Dendron, where Bobby is, it has two communities on this territory. One that are miners who are being treated as slaves to mine for something called glaze, and then the royal community who is controlling these slaves. And Bobby knows that his mission right now is to help these miners rebel against the royals and stop it. There's also an evil character named Saint Dane who keeps popping up, and I remember that he continues through the series, so I love that aspect of it. And I'm just really enjoying it so far. It's a different idea than the other books that I've been reading, so I'm excited to keep reading it and I should be finishing The Giver today so I will update you later on my thoughts on that. Okay I just finished The Giver and I'm giving it five stars. It was fantastic. It was engaging. It made me want to keep reading in the series especially because I didn't know the series existed and I remember when I was in school I had to write a story ending for the giver about what I thought happened at the end because it is kind of very ambiguous about whether he actually did, Jonas I mean, actually did escape with Gabe and did they find this city with lights and music and the memories that he held and I remember I had a very hopeful view of it and I still do especially now that I know that it was a series. I'm hoping that Jonas and Gabe escaped and were able to continue. I'm also kind of hoping that the series continues and um, tells us what happens in the community that Jonas left because the giver stays behind and tries to 
help the city with the memories that will be returning, the memories of loss and color and hunger and war and all these things that Jonas and the Giver were the only ones who had to deal with are now released to the whole village. So I'm kind of hoping that in the sequels I get to see some of that being worked through. But overall, I loved it, and I would highly recommend it to anybody. It was definitely worth a reread, especially since I haven't read it since seventh grade. So highly recommend it. It was five stars, and I am going to keep reading Pendragon today and see how far I can get. Okay, I have finished another 100 pages of Pendragon and it has been a beautiful afternoon. The weather's perfect. Brett and I are house sitting, so we went to the zoo today and now we are sitting out on the patio and just having a nice fire outside. You can see him, he's playing chess right now. <laughs> and I'm reading my book and just really enjoying some time by the fire. I am really enjoying Pendragon. I was telling Brent that I appreciate that it's different from other like young adult fantasy books because most of the time the chosen one is like the outcast and the big hurdles that they're overcoming are like external hurdles and Bobby in the book his biggest hurdle is that he is popular and he is um like coming from a very privileged place and He's facing internal struggles where he's deciding that he needs to start caring more about other people than he cares about himself. And so I love that he's not like a perfect protagonist and he's not like a an ideal person to be. As I was saying, I'm really enjoying the book and the last 100 pages have been kind of Bobby having a wake up call and seeing that he needs to start caring about other people. And putting other people first and stop thinking about all the things that he's missing out on and that he can't have because he's been chosen as a traveler he's still trying to figure out why all of this is happening and what he needs to do and what his plan should be and so i'm really enjoying him discovering what it means to be a traveler and what all of these like sciencey things actually are and where he is and who these characters that he's helping are so i'm really enjoying it I'm about halfway through now, so I'm going to keep reading and see how I feel. Good morning, everybody. I am still house sitting today. So I am just sitting outside with the dogs this morning and I brewed myself a cup of coffee and I am just planning on finishing Pendragon, the Merchant of Death while I'm sitting out here enjoying my cup of coffee and enjoying the beautiful sun. And I will update you when I finish a hundred more pages. Okay update on Pendragon from what I'm reading so far. I am really enjoying it. It got really intense in the last um, 100 pages. The story has very much been about Bobby has had this transformation. He's decided that he's not a great person and he wants to figure out how to save his uncle and how to care about everybody else and this whole society above himself and even though he's in danger like how to prioritize saving them and there have been a couple revelations so bobby learns that the reason he's a traveler and the reason travelers go to these different territories is that there's something called a turning point that every territory is about to face and the travelers are responsible for making sure that the turning point, which is an event that will either turn the territory towards peace and prosperity, or it would be it will be the thing that turns it towards chaos and will send all of Hala, which is like the universe as a whole, into eternal darkness. So Bobby learns this. He learns that the reason he's on Dendron is to 
make sure the turning point goes towards peace instead of chaos. However, what the event, what the turning point is, is not what Bobby thought it was. And so now he has to kind of like wrap his mind around this. And the biggest thing that happened in the last 100 pages that I think is really cool and is really interesting is that at the beginning of the book, Uncle Press, who is kind of like the head traveler from Second Earth where Bobby's from and is Bobby's uncle, told Bobby, you cannot take anything with you from your territory. You can only use what is available on that territory as part of your mission. You shouldn't, you can never bring anything else. Well, Bobby didn't remember this and asked Mark and Courtney to bring him things and so that he could use them to save these people. They brought Bobby what he asked for and now it's all kind of backfiring and those items that he brought with him are what is being used to turn the turning point towards chaos. So it's kind of like he brought it on himself and he's bringing on like the chaos instead of the peace. And so he's grappling with that and trying to figure out how to make up for his mistakes now that he knows he's the one that made these mistakes and he's the reason that this is happening in the first place. I'm um, only about 75 pages away from the end, so I can't wait. I will say there's something that I feel like needs to be addressed. The fact that the book is a little bit dated in terms of fat shaming, the weight difference between the Malago people and the Benduran people are being used to demonstrate a difference in resources. And so the Benduran people and the, the leader of the Benduran people especially is described as being so overweight and having all this access to food and resources, whereas the Milago people are very underfed, very skinny, <laughs> like they're starving, like they're the, lacking the resources they need to survive. And so the weight is being used kind of as a device for that to show the Benjurin people have all these resources and are not sharing them. And that's why the Milago people are, I mean, it's not the only reason, but food is one of the reasons and lack of resources are one of the reasons that the Milago people want to revolt. So I understand that. The reason it's dated is just the way that the people in the book who have access to resources and are overweight, they're just described so gruesomely and it just felt very fat shamey. And so I felt like I wanted to put that out there. Um, there are a couple fat shaming moments where I was a little like, oh, that's a little dated. and wouldn't be acceptable and it's written today. I will say that this that plot device is not used in the other Pendragon books. I think there are 10 in the series. And this is the only book where resources in terms of food and like weight differences are used as a plot device. So you can keep that in mind, make whatever judgment you will, but I thought it was important to bring it up. So I'm going to finish this book because I have 75 pages left and get back to you when I'm done. Okay, I just finished Pendragon the Merchant of Death, and I'm not gonna lie, it almost made me cry a little bit. Um, the ending is something I completely forgot about, and it hit me a little bit hard, and <laughs> I wasn't ready. I mean, it's not like earth shattering, but I thought that one of the like loose ends was going to be answered and like was gonna be tied up and I forgot that they don't tie it up in this book. They wait until the future. Bobby is upset. It kind of shook me a little bit. It had me a little bit emotional, but it was such a good ending and it makes me want to read the next one, especially because it all takes place in the same, like all of the Pendragon books follow the same world, but they're different from other young adult fantasy books because they all take place on a different territory. So you never know like what the world will be like that they're on and that Bobby is like exploring and saving and you never know what the problems will be or who the characters are going to be. And it's just such a fascinating concept. And it's why it's one of my favorite young adult fantasy series. I'm so happy I reread it. It's Brent's um, favorite series of all time. So it's special to both of us to read it and experience it again. Overall, I haven't decided on my rating 
for the Merchant of Death. Um, it's gonna be between a four and a five. I am leaning towards four just because there are some things that are a little bit dated and I think I originally gave it a four. The series overall is a five for sure, but I think that the first book is maybe gonna be a four, but I'm gonna run it through my rating system and see what it says. Overall, the last 100 pages were great and I really enjoyed it. Overall, I had a great month of rereading some YA favorites again. I picked some good ones. I think that all of them held up to how I remembered them. Obviously, I'm still just as obsessed with The Giver, if you couldn't tell from my vlogging experience. And that one is still considered one of my favorites of all time. I think my biggest surprises were how little I knew about Uglies, how much I forgot about this, and Ten Dragon, The Merchant of Death. It was a great book, but it did remind me that the first book is not as good as the entire series as a whole. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Now thinking back, I do remember that the first book was a little bit more focused on world building and setting up the whys and the hows and the who we're saving and what the point is and who all these characters are. And now moving forward in the series, if you were choosing to continue, it's more focused on the worlds that Bobby is traveling to and what their problem is and how he and Uncle Press are going to help them. So this book is great and was very helpful in setting that idea up and the concept up. And I think did a great job explaining it to young adults as to like what is happening and what these complicated like traveling dimensions and time space continuum nonsense is. It was very clear in that. And I think that the rest of the series as a whole is fantastic in terms of exploring the different worlds and letting you see all these different ideas come to life. And The Giver just blew me away, <laughs> always. <laughs> it's so good. I can't wait to keep reading because it's always been kind of left with an ambiguous ending, and I think that this quartet might just blow my socks off. Gosh, I hope so. <laughs> that is going to be all for me today, guys. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know if you've read these books or if you plan to reread them. Let me know what your thoughts were, and I will see you all next time. Bye, friends.